welcome back everyone so in today's video we'll begin with the problem which you know it's related to mechanics and thermal expansion so in this question we have a uniform long straight thin rod okay a b and it is placed on a rough inclined plane with an inclination of 37 approximately and the angle between the rod and the horizontal is also theta now the static friction coefficient between the rod and the inclined plane is one okay so the angle of repose is 45 degree so of course the rod ab will be in static equilibrium and when the temperature of the rod rises slowly the rod stretches uniformly but there is a point on the rod that is stationary relative to the inclined plane okay so in other words that there is a point which does not move with respect to the ground frame and then the question is what is that the ratio of the distance from the lower end a of the rod to the total length of the rod so let's say the point is somewhere over here and let's say this distance from the edge from the end a is x so they are asking about the value of x over l okay so that's the question number one and the second question the only difference is that now the rod is being slowly cooled rather than being slowly heated Okay, so and we have to assume that the inclined plane is not affected by the thermal expansion and contraction. Okay, so that's basically the question. So let's begin by uh, arbitrarily marking some point x and uh, let's say this is that point which is at rest relative to the incline. Okay, and of course we are now increasing the temperature of the rod which means the length of the rod is going to uniformly expand now. So, so we know that uh, this point X is a point that is fixed um, in the ground frame. So the point X is not going to move at all. So what that means is the points that are uphill to the point X, which basically belongs to these parts, okay? These uh, points are going to move uphill. So if I have to quickly draw the segment XB as the rod is elongating, right? Or the individual points on the segment XB is moving uphill. Okay, so the direction of friction from the ground on these particular points will be in the downhill direction. So let's just name this uh, as F1. Okay, so now if we draw the segment of XA similarly, all the segments, all the points attached to this segment will move in the downhill direction. Okay, and as they are slowly moving downhill, the direction of friction on these paths will be in the uphill direction. Okay, so, so we can name this friction as F2. Now, of course, the rod has to be in static equilibrium because if it was not in equilibrium, then what that would mean is the rod is going to slide downhill. And if it's sliding and if it starts sliding downhill, then no point on the rod can be at rest. So, of course, the forces are going to be balanced uh, in the direction of the rod. So we can say F2 minus F1 equals mg sine theta now of course the point x does not have to be the center of mass but the thing is the heating is being done so slowly that the motion of the center of mass is very slow so we can basically consider its acceleration to be zero okay so now we know f2 minus f1 is mg sine theta okay so now the thing is uh, we, as the friction uh, is kinetic at in these two parts we can write its magnitude we can relate its magnitude to the normal reaction exerted on each of these parts. The length AX, we can take it to be X. So the length XB is going to be L minus X. So F2, so it will be mu times the normal reaction on the AX part. So it will be mu. So I'm going to take mu mg cos theta outside. Okay. And I'm going to just put an X by L inside. Okay. Uh, and similarly for F1, it will be L minus X divided by L. Okay, and this would be equal to mg sine theta. So now all we have to do is solve for x and the answer comes out to be L by 2, 1 plus tan theta over mu. So the value of tan theta is 3 by 4, mu is 1. So this will be 7L divided by 8. Okay, so and this 1 by 8 is 0 0.125. So this would be 0 0.875 L. So the okay, so the fraction which is x by L is 0.875. Okay, so so this point is um, above. So the point x is like above the center of mass. So in this so in this particular case, the center of mass is actually moving downhill. Okay, so now for the other case where it's being cooled down, the only difference is that f1 and f2 are going to reverse its direction. So all we have to do is put a negative sign over here or a negative sign over here. So in the second case, it will be just L by two, one minus tan theta divided by mu. And this will be just L by eight, which is 0.125 L. So these are the two answers for this question. So now let's move on to the next problem. So in the next problem, we have a particle of mass M, 
that interacts gravitationally with a larger mass of capitalin. So moving around it in a stable circular orbit of radius R0. So a small impulse is given to the mass M so that it begins to perform small radial oscillations. Determine the ratio of the period of oscillations to the period of motion in the circular orbit. How would your answer change if there were stardust of density rho uniformly distributed throughout space? So we are supposed to use the first order approximation as well in this problem. Okay, so okay, so firstly the particle of mass m is in a stable circular orbit. Therefore, we can firstly write g m m over r naught squared equals m r naught omega squared. Okay, in this they they also asked us to include some stardust of density rho in the latter part of the question right so um, so rather than doing these separately we can just we can solve for the stardust case and finally set the density of the stardust equal to zero right for the first case okay so so we'll also consider some consider the stardust whose uh, uniform density was given to be rho okay so now uh, from electrostatics we know that if we have a uniformly charged sphere, uh, a solid sphere, and then the electric field at the surface it is just K total charge divided by R squared, right? So we can use that basic result over here as well. Here the gravitational field, let's say it is G. So G is just going to be Gm plus the stardust mass divided by R squared. Okay, so this is the value of G. So we'll just basically include that here as well. So we'll just add G small m times capital M times ms divided by R naught squared. So this is the F equal to ma equation for the case where we have the stardust present within. Okay, and of course the mass of the stardust uh, is going to be density times four by three pi R naught cubed. So we can just ca you know cancel out the small m's and substitute the value of ms. Okay, and we get this particular expression. So I'll just consider the initial angular velocity to be some omega naught. Okay, so this is the initial stable circular orbit equation. Okay, so now, so now the thing is the in the problem we are giving it a small radial impulse, meaning a very tiny radial velocity. So now what will happen is it will also perform some radial oscillations and it will keep moving in the large circular orbit. So Okay, so now the thing is that when the particle is given a radial velocity, let's say vr, the, there will be some radial acceleration. So I'm just going to call it as a that is associated with the change in the particle's radial velocity. On top of that, um, the particle is of course moving in the circular orbit um, with whatever velocity. And because of that uh, orbiting, it will also have the centripetal acceleration. Right, so this is the okay. So there will be two types of acceleration in the radial direction. So first is that, so this particular acceleration is because of the change in the radial velocity of the particle, and on top of that, we also have the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so now, so now let's do force balancing once again. So we can do force balance in the radial direction, r cap. So in the radial direction, the net acceleration is a minus the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so another thing is the angle omega is now gonna change. Okay, and that I'll explain in the next step why. So I'm just gonna so I'm gonna write it as omega instead of omega naught. So and uh, omega square multiplied by r. So now let's say um, you know of course once we give a radial impulse, the radial coordinate r naught is now gonna change, right? So it's not going to move in a circular orbit exactly. So now let's say the radial coordinate changed by some a small amount of delta r. Okay, so this will be omega square times r naught plus delta r. Okay, so because this is the new distance from the center mass capital M. Okay, so this is the ma term. So this will be equal to the net force, and the net force is just m into g, right? So that will be small m times now G is towards the minus R direction. So we'll put a negative sign here. Okay, and then we'll have GM divided by R naught plus Delta R squared. And then we'll also have the stardust term, which is going to be four by three rho pi G R naught plus Delta R. 
Okay, so now, uh, of course, we'll just use the first order approximation. But before we use that, uh, let's talk about uh, omega. So if you observe something as the net, the net force that acts on the particle m is a central force. So wherever the small m mass is present, the net force uh, is always towards the mass capital M. So if we say the mass M, mass capital M is the origin, then about the mass capital M, the net torque due to all forces acting on small m is zero, right? So, so what that means is the angular momentum of the particle M is conserved about the origin. So now if we conserve the angular momentum, well, angular momentum of a particle is just uh, m r square omega, right? So we can say r naught square omega naught square is just r naught plus delta r squared. So we can say r naught square omega naught equals r naught plus delta r squared times omega. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll substitute the value of omega into the first expression so we can cancel out the mass term as well. So I'm going to write a as r double dot, the double rate of change of r. And this would be equal to, so omega squared would mean, okay, so this is what we'll end up with. So now, of course, the we'll use the most common trick. So we'll just use a, we'll just take the r naught common from each of the binomial terms. So this will be one plus delta r by r naught. And the r naught cube just cancels out with the r naught to the power four. And here we'll have r naught squared. So now we can just uh, express each of these binomials as one plus nx. So we'll expand it to the first order in delta r. Okay, so now the thing is the, this term, this term, and this term, they just mutually cancel each other because they, that is essentially just the equilibrium condition. And, the, and if we take negative delta r common, what we get is three omega naught squared, two gm by r naught cubed, plus four by three rho pi g. Okay, so now um, instead of the value of omega naught squared, we can substitute it in terms of g, m and rho. Okay, so now because we took negative delta r common, this would be negative. Yeah, the four pi and the other term will be positive. Okay, so now after we substitute the value of omega naught squared, uh, this is the expression that we get. Okay, so now the equation of motion in the radial direction. So at r naught, what we did is we slightly displaced it by delta r. And it turns out the acceleration uh, is anti-parallel to the direction of delta r. And it is proportional to delta r. So this is obviously, you know, simple harmonic motion because we are only considering small impulses or small displacements from the mean position. So, okay, so in the question, what they asked is the ratio of the period of oscillation. So the, uh, so we figured out that radially the particle is going to perform simple harmonic motion. So the ratio of that to the ratio of the initial circular more circular orbit time period. So, so the time period for the radial SHM divided by the time period of the orbit. And uh, this would be just the inverse ratio of the omegas. So, so the, so let's say the angular frequency of the radial oscillation is ohm. So ohm is just going to be gm by r naught cubed plus eight by three pi rho g under root. And here, Omega naught is just going to be gm by r naught cubed plus four by three pi rho g under root. Okay, so the only difference is that there's a factor of two over here instead of eight over here instead of the four in the previous case. So t radial upon t orbit will be omega naught upon ohm. So this would be just um, this particular term, okay? So uh, if you observe something, if there is no stardust present, the radial oscillations and the orbit oscillations have the same time period, right? It will be gm by r naught cubed. And yeah, but, but in the presence of the stardust, it actually changes things by a bit. So now they have different time periods. So yeah, that's about it for this question. So guys, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to like, share and subscribe. And that's it. Thanks for watching.